Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Susan. I'm alcoholic. I don't know exactly how God chooses the people that he puts in our path when we intersect or when we part, but I have learned to pay attention. My sobriety date is September 22nd, 1986, and the what happened part was happening right about now. Um, I was 28 when I got sober, I'm 65 now, and with the grace of God, next month I'll have 37 years. And I hope, are there any uh, New York Metro people here? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I grew up on Long Island. Yeah. Um, about a few minutes from Jones Beach and about a 30 minute train ride from Manhattan. And it was a great place to grow up. And if you don't know what Jones Beach is, it's like if you took Siesta Beach and every two or three miles you put a Siesta Beach all the way across the south coast of Long Island in Nassau County. A lot of people say that they remember their first drink and this happened and that happened and they were enlightened and they were warmed and they were excited and they fit in. I can't tell you any of that. I can tell you that my first drink was captured on home movies. <laughs> it was in 1958. My dad was an executive for Schaefer Brewing in Brooklyn at that time. We had all this Schaefer stuff everywhere in our house, and um, I was on the boat, we were in the Great South Bay, my father handed me a can of Schaefer beer that, you know, had a little bit left in it, because I was a baby, I put it in my mouth, and um, this is what happened, I put the can in my mouth, I grimaced, licked my lips, smiled, and reached for the can back, and that's all on film. Drinking was normal in my house. It's what I thought adults did. My brother and I would go around and say, Mom, can I have a sip of your beer? It would be a mouthful. It would be half a can. My girlfriends, my best friend lived down the block. Her parents drank too. And if one of our parents ran out of a certain brand of alcohol on the weekends because the stores were closed on Sunday, they'd call each other. Do you have a bottle of this? Do you have a bottle of that? And so we became mules, and my parents would put the bottle in a brown paper bag and send us down the block, and my mother would say, if anybody asks what's in the bag, you tell them it's milk for the baby. <laughs> there was no baby. <laughs> then my house was kind of insane, like most of us who grew up in that situation. Um, I saw my mom have alcohol convulsions. I saw my father have his hands around her neck or punching through a wall or passed out on a couch. And when I was about 16, I got a job at Jones Beach. And I loved it. I loved it because it wasn't my regular school friends. It, it was new. It was hard work. I was validated. I was part of something. And I just, I loved it. We had a great time. We worked really hard. And each field would play the other. It's like softball. Field two, we play field six. And, and we'd play softball. And then we'd go to the band show and do square dancing. And then we'd go to happy hour. And no one really had a good time. It was good for me at that time. But I got this fun, happy buzz. Just a fun, happy buzz. A simple, fun, happy buzz. I chased that fun, happy buzz for the next 10 years. We worked really hard, and when I was about 21, my dad, who was a drunk, and he used to put um, vodka in his coffee every morning, he heard onward Christian soldiers coming out of our refrigerator <laughs> and decided he needed some help. It was kind of like an early alcoholic Bluetooth kind of thing, I think. <laughs> and he got help. They moved to Sarasota. I quit college, got a job in New York. Of course, you know, I fit right in. I'm a lost alcoholic. I fit right in the insurance industry downtown. 
and I learned to drink even more. I would go through Penn Station, and if I saw somebody who had, I had known from high school or college or work, I would avoid them, because to me, they all had houses and spouses and kids, and I didn't have any of that, because I didn't know how to live. I didn't know how to do it. I felt like there was this assembly line that everybody was put together before they got here, but they were out of stock on some part. <laughs> and they just said, oh, well, just, you know, stamp her okay and send her through. Nobody will notice. I kept thinking that, you know, there was this part missing. And I learned how to really drink a lot, like business lunches, drinking at lunches, meeting at the bar, going after the bar to a place to drink more beer and, and then taking the train home and drinking a beer there. But beer got really inconvenient. Convenient. My clothes would get tight. My eyes would disappear into my face. The bathroom visits were annoying. So I decided, being there rather mathematical, that I could pack a bigger punch drinking Jeff Daniels than beer. And I could get more for my money, ounce for ounce, and take up less room. And um, I knew, though, that I would drink as much as was available. And I lived alone. Family was down here. And I knew that if something happened, nobody would know about it for days. So I did kind of control my portion. But what I also did was I thought this was very smart. I drank it right out of the bottle. Because this made total sense. I had no friends. I wasn't going to share it. I knew from the onset I was going to finish it. So why should I have to wash it last? It made perfect sense. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I still do that today. Um, only now it's like a cardboard container and hogging dust. Wash that <laughs> washable. I um, I did crazy things like one time I came home with a six pack of Michelob bottles. I lived on the fourth floor. I dropped them in the parking lot and I got so I left them there. And I got up to my apartment and I started sobering up and I wanted more. But I didn't have any because I just drank it all. So I looked out my window. I thought, wait, maybe they didn't all break. <laughs> so sure enough, I go down and only two of them broke. So I carried the other four up, left the two broken ones there, and I went upstairs and drank some more. I mean, this is the kind of stuff I did. But inside, I knew that part was missing. I knew that once I started, I didn't stop. I knew that I didn't drink with, like other people. And I knew that I was always trying to find that fun, happy buzz that I used to get when I was younger and working at the beach. That's the what it was like. This is what happened, and it started in August of 1986. My pattern was that I would come home from work, drink, pass out, wake up at 1 a.m., watch reruns of Ben Casey, and then fall asleep just in time to get up for work and do it all over again. Then one night, I had a dream. The dream took place in a room with green cement block walls. In the corner was a tall folding ladder. And someone handed me a note, one of these pink notes that we used to get when we worked in offices before we was there. And it said, important message. Sorry, I'm nervous. And the note said, Susan, I'm sorry, I can't be there to speak. I didn't know what this meant. It was from Chuck. I woke up, and I had to find Chuck. Okay, who was Chuck? <coughs> Chuck was my schoolmate and friend growing up. I will tell you, we were very different, and this was like upscale section of Long Island. There was no father in his house, which was very, this was like, from the early 60s up to maybe mid-70s, we were in school together. And it was really unusual that there wasn't a father in the house, and nobody knew where his father was. His mom, God bless her, she worked really hard to raise four kids alone and make sure that they had what they needed. But Chuck was the kind of kid that his desk was next to the teacher's desk all the time, and he was always on the edge of getting in trouble. And while he was like on a path to being a biker, I was on a path to being a yuppie, we got along. We did art projects together. We danced polkas together. And when I was in high school, a kid was um, bullying me and 
Chuck saw it, and he grabbed the guy and threw him into a locker, and he told him, don't you ever hurt her again, and I loved it. <laughs> but he never bothered me again. So here it is, like, I don't know, 10 years after we graduated, and I had a dream on a piece of paper that he couldn't be there to speak, and it was, I had to find him. We didn't have internet, we had phone books, and I knew his old address, remembered his siblings' names, and I tried to find him. And I finally reached his brother and said, please have Chuck call me. I go back to my routine of passing out, waking up, watching Ben Casey, drinking Jack Daniels out of the bottle, and I passed out one night, and my phone rings, and it's Chuck. And he says to me, I hear you've been trying to find me. Was I ever? So we decided we were going to meet at Hands in Roosevelt Field, and um, it was a weeknight. So I started getting ready, and I met him. I met him at the bar. He bought me a drink. He did not order one for himself. We got a table. He told me the reason that he didn't drink was because he was in AA. He told me horrendous stories of what his life had been like when he was drinking. And then he told me that the reason his father was not around was because he was in prison, was because he had robbed a bank using a bottle of nitroglycerin as his weapon. And when he got the money, he went to a bar, started grabbing, spending money, and that's where the police found him. Now I'm gonna tell you, I tried to control my drinking, but I never could. I tried. I'm only gonna drink one. Alcohol one. I'm not going to go to happy hour. Alcohol one. I'm not going to go out tonight. Alcohol one. No matter what I try, alcohol is always, always one. And I honestly didn't know how to live without it. How do people go to parties without drinking? How do you go to a picnic without drinking? How do you drive to the grocery store without drinking? I didn't know how to give it up. So Chuck and I said goodbye that night. It took five more weeks. I went to a wedding that was on my grandmother's birth. My grandmother's going to be like 88. So that meant my dad left Sarasota, came to New York to be with his mom for her birthday on the same weekend that my friend Eileen was getting married. It was a pretty dismal weekend. I don't remember much of it. I, people were disgusted with me. It was awful. I'll tell you two other things. I did not have a telephone answering machine because I did not want to walk in every night and see that there were no messages. I also did not believe in God. In college, I wrote papers about how man created God to explain the things that science couldn't. So we had this really, really awful, awful week. I woke up Monday morning, and you know, I knew I was at the edge. It was like I was on the high diving, not board, not even the board, those cement things where you fall off. And I knew that either I was tumbling in or I was going to back track. And I swung my legs out of bed, sat at the edge, I looked up at the ceiling at something I had never believed in before, and I said, God, I can't do this anymore. So now what? My father was at this hotel. So now I had to call the man who knew I had a problem and tell him I had a problem. And I did. For some reason, I did. I called him up and I said, Dad, I have a problem with alcohol. He put on his Superman cape, like that was his thing. And I ran into the office. I went into New York, I tried to clear up a few things. And as I was leaving, I was walking through Penn Station. And I passed the place where I usually buy my beer for the train ride home. And I looked, and I stopped, and I thought, and then I heard a voice. And it said, there's only time for one, one is not enough, and besides, you've had your last drink. By that night, I was in detox. And I did what they said, and I wanted what they had. And I went to meetings. I went to meetings in downtown Manhattan, 
during the day, and I went to the meetings in New Hyde Park and Leola during the night. And I put my hand up. I'm Susan, I'm an alcoholic. I'm Susan, I got 17 days. I'm Susan, I got 34 days. And they clapped, and they came to see if I was all right. And they asked me if I wanted to go out. They asked me if I needed anything. They told me I had to have a woman sponsor. I was not thrilled. I expect, I was like, I'm not being part of some sewing circle of women and they tell me what to do. I'm not doing that. But the nurse, the nurse at the detox, she was a tough lady. She had owned a bar and she became a detox nurse. And I liked her. So I asked her to be my sponsor. And you know what? She said yes. She had said no to almost every patient who passed through that place. But she said yes to me. And around five weeks or so, I started thinking, how come Eileen's wedding was on Grandma's birthday when Daddy had to be here, and how come Lori said yes, and why was I in that detox coach? By the way, there was one wing full of old men and one wing full of, like, five single guys and me. So, you know, God was knew what to do to get my attention. Why did all that happen? How did that? And that's when I kind of realized that it was so much, so many things had to fall into place that there I realized that I was powerless over alcohol and I was turning my life a little over to God that I had never believed in before. And I would call Lori up, kind of like Charlie Brown. Every time, you know, some indignity of not getting what I wanted or what I think I should have, and I'd call her up like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and she would say, Did you eat today? Yes. Do you have a dollar in your pocket? Yes. Do you have a roof over your head? Yes. Do you have a clean bed to sleep in? Yes. Did you drink today? No. Then, honey, you don't have any problems. <laughs> and you know, that's what I needed. I needed somebody just like that. And I'd go to meetings, and I just I just loved, I loved what was happening, what I've seen around me. I was like, wow, this is like, this is bigger than Jesus. This is just, I couldn't believe it. It was like, world peace. We should all be doing this. And back at the time, in the time, um, Dr. Pepper was really popular. So I'm going to use the word alky, even though I don't like it, but it's two syllables. So I'm like so thrilled here that this is bigger than Jesus. We're going to have world peace. A wonderful program. Why doesn't everybody use it? And I would sit there and say, I'm an alky, you're an alky, he's an alky, she's an alky. Wouldn't you like to be an alky to be an alky? You know, that's probably only funny if you remember Dr. Pepper. I remember my stuff's getting old now. So I get to have a year... And I told Lori, my sponsor, my story about Chuck. And she said to me, you need to tell him what he did for you. So now I have an answering machine. I'm calling all, all over town to try and find him. And I left messages. And where I got sober, you could pick your speaker on your first anniversary. And you could pick your cake. I mean, it was all about you. And so I called him up left him a message, walked in one night, my phone machine was blinking, and it was Chuck. And he said, Susan, I'm sorry I can't be there to speak. Mm. Important message. I went to my anniversary meeting, had my cake, got my coin, and realized after going to this meeting every Saturday at 2 o'clock, the walls were green cement block. There was no ladder in the back, but there were 12 steps on the wall. So when I tell you to pay attention to how people intersect in our lives, it's mean, it means something. So I kept coming to meetings, and about three years sober, I moved down here. Actually, I used to come down here at Christmas time to visit my folks, and I met Dick back there in a long key meeting before I moved here. And I moved here, came to this meeting, but she became a sponsor. 
got involved, started a meeting because I had a resentment, so I got a coffee pot and started a meeting. <laughs> and um, I went to the Wednesday night meeting at the Church of the Incarnation, <clears throat> and there was this blonde guy there that I thought was kind of cute. And then I'd see him out there in the courtyard on Saturdays. So one Saturday, I was standing out there where the old smoking meeting used to be, and he came up to me and he said, so what do you do on the weekends? I spent every weekend with him since, and we're going to be married 31 years in October. <laughs> we had a child who had the blessings of growing up in, in a non-alcoholic home two sober parents. She did it right. You know, she, she went to college. She knew what she wanted to be. She became it. She got a degree. She got a master's. She has no debt. She bought a condo. She's growing in her career. She didn't see a drunk person until she went to college. But she was always a really, really big thinker. She, why? Why? It was always a why on and, um, you know, she kind of grew up with this program. And, um, she, well, she did grow up with this program. She's just not, she doesn't qualify. So, um, she came home one time when she was five. And she she was so concerned. Because girl, little girls are doing, you know, the little girl rapping natty thing that they do. And she was concerned. And I said, okay, let's make a God box. So we made a guide box, and I told her how to use it. And when she had some problem, she should just write it down and put the problem in the guide box, and it would be taken care of. Years later, probably two decades later, later, I'm cleaning the house, and I'm moving her bed, and there's this box under there, and I don't know what the heck it is. And I look at it, and I realize that it was her guide box from when she was little. She didn't even live with us anymore. But I'm still a good mom, so I looked in it just to make sure. <laughs> and do you know what was in that box? Thank you notes. A whole bunch of thank you notes. I remember when she was a baby, we used to come to this meeting there, and Fudgy would take her and sit in the back of the room and hold her so that I could focus on a meeting instead of having to be a mom for an hour. I can't tell you the blessings I have with this program. When I, if I were to walk through Penn Station today, you know those houses and spouses and kids? Well, I have all that there. And it's only because I didn't drink and I went to meetings. And I sat up front and I got a sponsor. And I, I, I'm sorry I didn't make coffee, but you'd be really glad that I didn't make coffee. And I would refuse to do ashtrays because it was disgusting. You know, and they were still smoking meetings back then. Um, and I do what's suggested. I have a higher power. I work the steps. I work the steps over and over and over again. Do you know why? Because each time I do a step, I learn something new. And now I'm different. And now I've changed. That means my mindset is different. And I have to see it again. And I've been working these steps over and over for all these years. And the more I work them, the less I know. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is that the steps are really interesting. There's some really cool things there. Like the vocabulary that they use is really, really significant, and pay attention to that. If they only use in the eighth and ninth step, they only use the word apology once. They don't define unmanageable. They don't define God. They don't define drunk. Because if you define it, you limit it, and it's in a box. So they didn't do that. They said the hoop you have to jump through is wider than you think. I kind of don't think of it as a hoop, really. I think of it more of like a big elastic waistband that stretches where you need it. <laughs> but my God fits through there. You know, and then I learned that I had to meet the Brown family and all their drama. And I had drama myself. And I had to tell somebody about it. Six, six and seven, when I learned that I designed coping mechanisms that helped me survive but they didn't serve me anymore. And I asked God to take them away. Eleven, really cool. Meditation, they use the word envision five times. 
It says, but who can build a house until you first envision a plan? Makes sense, doesn't it? Clinton and I know something about houses. Can you imagine building a house, not having a plan? Hello, Home Depot, I'm building a house. Send some stuff over. <laughs> what kind of stuff? I don't know. Then we'll figure it out. We haven't figured it out yet. Just send it over. Big house, small house, little house, old house, new house, modern house, quaint house. Don't know. Send the stuff over. We'll be fine. We'll figure it out. Now, it encourages us to know what we want, to have an idea so that when we meditate, we can figure that out and then God can help us. Well, I just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Hope that I help people as much as you all have helped. I want to thank Rick for allowing me to speak tonight. I am a member of the Donut Hour, and uh, come and see us Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, thank you for your time, and good night, good sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.